it's glorious that, that to receive a miracle. But I think it's possibly as great when God uses us in passing on a miracle. If I can. You know, when God does a miracle in you, and when God does a miracle through you. And today, I think today will probably be more of the second part. Okay, so for the visitors, I see we have a couple of visitors this morning. Um, I need to be mindful of where I walk. Um, this is going to be the first of about three weeks. So you haven't really missed out something. But when I start, it's going to sound as if you've missed out on some stuff. There is a bit of background knowledge, but um, we'll cover all of that, don't worry. So, um, Acts chapter 1 verse 8. So, Acts 1 verse 8 it says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the utmost parts of the earth. Okay. So, now I'd like us to kind of personalize that a bit. And you don't have to do this out loud. Just to, to think through it, say, but we have received power when the Holy Spirit came upon us, and we will be your witnesses in George, in the Garden Route, in the Western Cape, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And now maybe you can tweak it slightly more and say, but I have received power when the Holy Spirit came upon me. And I will be your witness in, at home, at school, etc., at work, in the mall, in George, in the Garden Route, in the Western Cape, and to the uttermost parts of the world. And then when we've said that, and please, this is not condemnation, when we said that, these are rhetorical, by the way, there will be three questions. The first one is, when last did you talk to a friend about your faith? If, if we are full with the Spirit and we have the opportunity to testify, when last did, we, last did we actually just chat to a friend about your faith? Just, you know, God has really been so good to me. When last did you mention your faith to, let's call it a stranger, someone that's, that's not in your, in your circle of friends? It's just mention, you know. God has really been so kind. And thirdly, when last did you actually lead someone to Jesus? Okay. Let's start. We're going to talk about walking in step with God. Okay. Walking in step with God. So this one is going to be all about walking, as in physical walking. So, Our full Christian walk is impossible, or is only possible, when we live in partnership with the Holy Spirit and thereby remain in God, remain in the vine, John 15, as friends of God. Amen. Okay, wonderful. I'll, I'll repeat that. Our full Christian walk is only possible when we live in partnership with the Holy Spirit, thereby remaining in God as friends of God. So, how do we do this? How do we walk this Christian walk? They say that, on average, we walk about 10,000 steps a day. Um, some of you have fancy watches that actually record your steps and you want to make sure that you get your full 10,000 in. So you might do a few laps around the bed at night to make sure that you've got your 10,000 before you go to bed. You can see I've been getting my 10,000 by going to the fridge and back. In the event. So they, they say, you know, on average, 10,000 steps a day. Now, believe it or not, that... Um, I think Mike will obviously go further than Molly Ann in, in his 10,000. But on average, again, they say that it adds up to about 180,000 kilometers in a lifetime. Okay, so that's far. You know, write to Discovery and tell them that. Tell them to cut your premiums. Because, depending on where you are, you have circumvented the globe a couple of times. You see, your 180,000 kilometers in a lifetime equals more than four times around the globe. And yet you say you never get to travel. <laughs> Come on. You see, so, so what is my point? My point is, what if 
if we change the way that we walk physically, can actually change somebody else's life. <laughs> That's probably hardly possible. But if we have a look at how we walk, where we walk, would it be possible that our physical walk could actually affect and change somebody else's life? For those of you who remember John Cleese, if we can have that, that video clip, um, this is rather silly, and so I've decided to cut it at about a minute. The amazing thing is that I've actually once pulled a hamstring by just watching rugby. I don't know how he does that. <laughs> but, okay, so why that? Well, firstly, if you watch the whole clip, I think it's quite funny. That's why. But in any event, I think that it would be really terrible if we as the church have developed a sense of a silly walk. And what I mean by that is, as believers and as the church... We, we come to the Sunday service and we go back home. We pop into a midweek service or a ladies' meeting or a prayer meeting or a life group meeting and we go back home. But do we actually break outside of our routines? Do we actually step out in partnership with the Holy Spirit? That's the, the whole question. So last week I mentioned this quote. It says, life's greatest moments evolve from simple acts of cooperation with God's mysterious promptings, nudges that will always lead to finding what has been lost and saving, or sorry, and releasing what has been enslaved. Life's greatest moments evolve from simple acts of cooperation with God's mysterious promptings, nudges, that always lean towards finding what has been lost and freeing or releasing what has been enslaved. And so this begs the question that if we are each taking roughly 10,000 steps each day, and if life's greatest moments depends on us stepping out in cooperation, in partnership with the Holy Spirit, then should we as believers not rethink and change the way that we go about our business, the way that we simply walk? Just think for a moment. If the, the distance... In an average room, this is slightly larger than average. The distance across an average room is about 10 steps, which means if you're taking 10,000, it's only 1,000 of your, your daily walk. In other words, it's 1% of a percentage. It's 0.1% of your average daily distance covered. What if those 10 steps can actually impact somebody else's life? What if, if taking those 10 steps can actually not only impact, but change that person's entire eternity? Imagine that. What if taking those 10, 10 steps can actually change somebody's eternal destination? And it was all as simple as taking 10 steps across a room. I'm sure we'd be interested. All right, just for a moment then, Imagine with me that you're at some form of a, a social gathering, whether it's um, one of those lovely parent-teachers meetings, or a braai, or a birthday party, or literally having coffee right after the service. Now, you're obviously standing with your friends, with your group, with your people. You're in the zone. 
the comfort zone. The zone is the place where there is absolutely no risk of awkward silences, awkward questions, because you know one another. It's the zone. That's why you're in the zone. But then you notice somebody standing unintentionally and uncomfortably alone. Now you have a choice. You can do one of two things. You can move slightly so that they fall outside of your peripheral vision and continue in the zone. Most of us do. Or we can actually move out of our zone, take 10 steps, and enter something extremely dangerous called the zone of the unknown. <laughs> the foreign zone, their zone. And what if the Holy Spirit is saying, you know what? Just take some steps with me and let's see what happens when we get there. Let's just kind of put out your hand and say hello. The wonderful thing is we provide name tags. So you can actually say, hello, David. Lovely to see you this morning. Love your check shirt. Excellent. Just getting into their zone. Maybe a conversation will, will start developing. Maybe, maybe not. But there's a really good chance that it won't be the end of the world. You see, more often than not, that person will not even be a total stranger. It will probably be somebody that you've seen a couple of times. You might have actually said hello in passing. But this time, you're walking differently. You, the approach is different. The approach is not, I'm coming for you. No, the, the, the walking differently simply means, I'm walking intentionally. I'm intentional to, to connect with this person. Because I'm actually walking across this room in partnership with the Holy Spirit. I'm walking across to go and say hello as a friend of God. Just a few steps can possibly be and lead to a life-changing experience for you. <laughs> you see, for the other person as well, possibly, hopefully. But the thing is, once we obey that, that nudge of the Spirit and we, we step out of our zones, of our comfort zones, and we actually walk across the room and we make that connection, then something will change inside of us as we feel the Spirit of God working through us. And my life will not be the same again. You see, my life and, and your life was changed when someone took a step across the room. A very large room, in this case, called the universe. Because at some point in time, some point what heaven calls eternity, but what we will call history, Jesus Christ chose to leave the immediate presence of the Trinity. He chose to leave thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of angels angels and angelic beings constantly in worship of him to leave the immediacy of heaven itself, to leave his zone. And then he, he clothed himself with humanity, humanity and he, he stepped into our zone and he held out his hand to me and to you without any guarantees at all. So Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ took a huge step throughout the universe to come to this earth to come and die for us. While we were still sinners. The true Christian walk, therefore, is actually quite simple. We love others because he first loved us. We forgive others because he first forgave us. We serve others because he first served us. And we, we walk across a room, we take a couple of steps because he was the first one to take the huge step towards us. And so Philippians chapter 2, 5 to 11 says the following. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped and held on to, but he made himself nothing taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. 
And therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. In heaven and on the earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And so this morning we can sit here and we can confess that Jesus Christ is my Lord to the glory of the Father. See, as Christians, our, our primary mission should be to constantly step out of our comfort zone and to connect with people in such a way that actually points them, nudges them towards Christ. Our calling as, as the church is to live lives so in love, so in awe, so in step with God and so in step with His Holy Spirit that daily when we connect with people, whether they are friends, whether they're family, colleagues, uh, acquaintances, random people, that we leave them with a smile on their faces and with harm, hearts that are warm towards God and the church and Christianity. Amen. I find it interesting that there are many people out there that, that somehow seem to love God but hate the church. This really shouldn't be the case. You see, the church was always God's intention. It was always God's plan. It was his idea. The church is his model of, of kingdom living. And so we are called as his people to represent him well and to represent his kingdom well. And the great news is it never, ever requires of me to become religious or verse-quoting, promise-reciting Nutcase. Good morning, I'm the head and not the tail. You cop off. You see, we, we all get to connect with people. We all get to connect with people very naturally every single day in any event. And so how about when we connect with them, for us to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, sensitive to the Holy Spirit, and to listen to what they are saying, and to where they are at. And then to be able to actually testify about God's goodness in that area of our lives. So we're going to be walking around, we're going to be connecting with people in any event. Whether it's the petrol attendant or the, the girl at the checkout counter, etc. But let's walk intentionally. Let's be plugged into God, listen to the Holy Spirit, listen to them, be intentional to hear what they are saying. So that we can respond effectively, in a meaningful way, sharing God's goodness in our lives in that area. You see, we've, we've been empowered by God to testify, Acts 1 verse 8, to the goodness of God. And so therefore, let's tell the stories of how you've experienced God's love and God's encouragement and God's forgiveness and His grace and His protection. You see, this is why it's important to realize that we we have a testimony. We each have a story to tell. We, we actually, we have a number of stories to tell. Because the, the teller at the till who's just lost a loved one doesn't want to hear how you got saved. She wants to hear how God carried you through your darkest hour. The mom at the, at the parent-teacher meeting who's recently been retrenched needs to hear how God provided for you. Your colleague who's just been burgled over the weekend wants to hear how God protected you and that God still protects you. The lady at the bank whose daughter's been diagnosed with cancer needs to hear that God still heals today. Amen. So don't just bring your one story of, in 1974, I... Was saved, and I'm so glad. That's excellent. But let's, you see, sometimes I realize that we need to take note of what God is doing in our lives. And because it's only when we realize, when we take note of what God is doing, that we can actually 
sit up, smell the roses, smell the coffee, and actually share and repeat that story of the goodness of God. Because so often, God's goodness, we are so surrounded with the goodness of God that we don't even realize that this is God just pouring himself over me. And his love, his kindness, his provision, his whatever. Just think for a moment. Let's just stop and think. Of the goodness of God in your life in the past week. You're welcome to close your eyes. One incident in the last week of the goodness of God in your life. And then think if there was an incident in the last week where you were able to release, to display the goodness of God to somebody else in that week. The thing is, so often we get to live this, this busy life where we neglect to see and to pay attention to the goodness and the protection and the provision of God. And we, we either just wash over it completely or we kind of see there's some good fortune. Isn't it amazing that a very ordinary farmer once had an extraordinary potato crop and decided to tell people about it to the point that they made a film about it, to the point that now he's filling stadiums with hundreds of thousands of people and where he's led probably millions of people to Christ because of potatoes. Would you have told somebody a potato story? <laughs> he's moved beyond the potatoes but there's, there's something there that was extraordinary. God had something incredible. And he took note. We need to cultivate the ability to, to recognize and to articulate the goodness of God in our own lives and to point it out in the lives of somebody else. Amen. It's quite often that, that people stumble over the goodness of God in their lives as well. And so we need to develop this ability to recognize it and to articulate the goodness of God in our own lives, but also to see it and to point it out in the lives of others. You see, I honestly believe that every single person will be in a radically different place and live a vastly better life if they knew the love and the grace and the redemption of God. We have to ask ourselves, do I genuinely believe that? Do I genuinely believe that every single person on this planet will be in a very different place and have a life that is vastly different and vastly better if they had an encounter, if they experienced the love, the grace, and the transformation, the redemption of the Lord in their lives? You see, I believe this because of the life that I get to live ever since Jesus invaded my life and gave me identity, love, and acceptance. And so we have to ask ourselves this question. Why are so many people going to the bathroom this morning? Not that one. But, um, focus. We have to ask ourselves this question. Who is the God that I know? What is he like? Is he? The one who lovingly formed you in your mother's womb? Is he the one who, who watches over your coming and going? Is he the one who leads you along a specific path for your life that he chose and ordained for you? Is he the one who encourages you to, to keep in step with the dreams that he dreams over your life? Is he the one who keeps showing you that your life has great significance? That you will leave a mark on your immediate group and maybe much wider than that. See, because people who walk across the room, people who take those 10 steps, 
firstly landed on the idea that the God that they know, the God that they serve, is worth knowing, is worth serving, made a huge difference in their life. And that's what they want to go and share. Maybe not in that first moment, maybe somewhere along the line as this relationship develops. But firstly, we need to know that our God is worth knowing. And then, come to think about it, the the reality is that each one of us seated here this morning is actually seated here this morning because someone took the time out to walk across a room or lean across a desk and to share with us the greatness of our Lord Jesus Christ and his gospel. And so maybe you say, well, not really for me. I grew up in a Christian home. Yet, still, at some stage, someone had to make it, plain, make it plain for you to understand. At some stage, this mystical gospel was clarified to you, and you could understand it, and you could respond to it. And so when the, when the penny drops that Jesus took the initiative to walk across the room to this planet, and that someone else walked across the room at some stage in your life, in your history, towards you, to connect you with that God personally, and that you and I are surrounded by opportunities every single day to walk across the room, to go and connect with someone. If those three things kind of align like planets, then we cannot help but step out. Then I become a a compass that is pointing to Jesus all the time. Once again, not in in a weird way, not in some crazy Coming in the mouth, eating locust way. In a, in a natural way that loves God and is convinced that he will only do you good. You, real, you, you and I need to realize that we're in a position to interact with people that, that only you can connect with. That's why God placed you there. The people that, that you're around on a daily basis, you are their window into Christianity. And sometimes you are their only example of Christianity. So live as though you believe that your parents or your classmates or your colleagues or your neighbors will be better off if they knew God the way you know him. Live in partnership with the Holy Spirit, expecting those promptings, and then act upon it. Not motivated by fear or guilt or manipulation, but by the overwhelming knowledge that the same God that radically transformed your life also has a plan and a purpose and an intention with their lives. And so, as we go into this week as I'm closing, let's determine to walk differently this week. But let's not... Extend it to somewhere in the week. Thursday morning, 10 o'clock. Walk differently. I said this morning at Preserve's Prayer, last week you might remember that there was a call for different people to to come out. And uh, one of the calls was for people that tend to procrastinate. And um, procrastination for other (coughs) young symbol dwellers simply means to postpone, to Wait for tomorrow. So. And so I had a chat to somebody afterwards, um, later in the day, in fact. So there was this call um, to come forward for procrastination. And um, did you not think it would be a good idea to go forward? I said, well, I thought about it. And I was contemplating, thinking, Should I, shouldn't I go? Um, and um, by, uh, yeah, well, when I, when I decided this, it, it might be a good idea, um, as I was about to get up, everybody had gone for coffee already, and uh, most people had left. So, um, so we, we would like to extend this, the, the call for people that battle with co- pro- procrastination for this week as well. You've, got, you've had a week now, <laughs> if, if, uh, if it's okay. Um, and and we'll, we'll keep it open for next week if, if you don't make it for this week. Um, <laughs> But coming back to to this morning, I don't want us to just extend it for another week. 
I want to ask that we'll be brave. And right now when we say amen and we get up to have our coffee, I see the, the coffee station is the back there and the back there, that today when you have coffee, that you'll connect with someone that you don't normally connect. Brave that zone of the unknown, if it's okay. You see, unless we, we do it right here, right here in Liberty, we definitely won't do it out there. Unless we do it today, we won't do it somewhere in the week either. And again, you're not required, we'll get to that next week or the week after, you're not required to lead this person to the Lord. They're probably saved if they're here. Uh, so don't expect this person to say hello and fall on the knees and say, please take me to your leader. <laughs> Just a, a hello and a cup of coffee would be great. Just a connection. Amen.